I should have been able to do it from my head anyway, Rick. I was looking for my notes, and the Lord provided. <laughs> Can't trust your brothers today. John chapter 17, verse 18. We'll be uh, reading this in a moment, but I'd first like to ask you a question. How many of you would like to be uh, in Kuwait this morning? Hands up. Nobody? No volunteers? Uh, the reason for that is because of the turmoil and the stress and the danger for those who are there from Saddam Hussein and his, um, and his armies. How many of you would like to be the uh, Iraqi diplomatic ambassador in Canada or the United States this morning? I have to admit, we're a little more civilized over here than they are over there. Um, I, I just thought about that a little bit in the last few weeks because these guys have been in the news, haven't they? You know, they hold side, sidewalk uh, news releases and um, conversations with people trying to defend the actions of uh, their president over there. And uh, they're in a pretty tickly situation themselves, aren't they? I mean, if if their uh, president does anything um, dramatic to uh, the world's diplomats that are incarcerated over there, uh, their lives are probably going to be a little touch and go over here. You know, I don't think anybody would assassinate them, but you just never know. And it's, uh, it's kind of important, isn't it, uh, who you follow? Uh, really, an ambassador is really a follower. Those guys, their, their job is to represent their country in another country. And those of us who know the Lord Jesus as our Savior and who have decided to follow Him with our lives are sort of like those ambassadors. It's not easy some places to do that. But if we're going to represent Jesus Christ, we need to stand. We need to stand and uh, do just that. No matter how difficult or how easy it is, we should stand and represent Christ. And that's what our study for the last uh, three weeks has been. Uh, we have been looking at discipleship and following Jesus, what it really means to be a learner and a follower, a committed doer of Christ. And uh, we have uh, stressed that there's not, it's not the same thing just to be a Christian and also being a disciple. We, the scriptures seem to be very plain in distinguishing that you become a Christian by faith in Jesus Christ. You become a disciple by a conscious choice to commit your life in service to Him, that you'll stand up publicly and say, I am a follower of Christ. I am now going to adjust my life according to His dictates. Jesus is not just my Savior, but now I'm going to allow Him to be the Lord of my life. And uh, discipleship is really God's plan. And that's the first thing we looked at a few weeks ago, is uh, step one. It's kind of important to realize that plan that God has, that for you to be saved is the first step. But God doesn't want you to remain merely a Christian or a baby. He wants you to grow. He wants you to develop. He wants to make something out of you. He wants you then to become a disciple. And that requires a second choice on your part. That's God's part in discipleship. We looked in our second study at discipleship, disciples as individuals, you and I. When we cross that line in our Christian lives where we will say, Lord, I bow the knee to you. I'll allow you to direct my life. I'll submit to you. I'll serve you. We get something out of it. We really get a lot of things out of that. We get benefits. That's the blessedness. There are blessings that are only available to disciples. And a lot of Christians are suffering in their own lives because of an unwillingness or because of an ignorance on their part, not being aware of what it of how great it is to actually be a committed follower of Jesus Christ. You can't just take all the promises in the book and make them yours. There's a little chorus that kids sing in school. You know, all the promises in the book are mine. Um, I, that's all I can sing at the moment, but there's, that's not actually quite true. You know, God made promises to Abraham that don't apply to you and to me. You know, God has a promise that we're going to live in the land of Palestine forever and ever and ever. Or that we'll have a multitude of descendants 
as many as the sand of the sea. You have to pay attention to what the scriptures say in the context in which the promises are given. And some promises are given to Christians. Jesus said, uh, believe, believe in the Lord Jesus, or the scriptures say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the promise is, you will be saved. Right? Do you believe in Jesus? Promises to you, then you will be saved. But if you want to know the truth and to be delivered in your personal life from sin and ignorance, then you have to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 32, He that continues in my word, if you continue in my word, truly you are my disciples, and the truth will set you free. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That implies that many Christians who haven't fulfilled that condition aren't experiencing those promises. And so some Christians, mere Christians who are not disciples, can't claim those promises of really knowing the truth and really being delivered in their lives. That's a sad thing. And I just stress that this morning because discipleship isn't um, a taboo subject. It ought to be a, a thing that we all anticipate, that we are anxious to receive, anxious to submit to. We, we're uh, anticipating following the Lord because of the benefits. Last week we looked at the blessings that happen to other people. That we looked at the aspect of discipleship that it's not just for me, but I become a follower of Jesus Christ basically to serve. And when I serve Christ, that really means Jesus first, others second, yourself last. Right? You've heard that, eh? J-O-Y, Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. When you put yourself in submission to Christ, then your life is going to be spent in service to other people. Other people are going to get the benefits and, the, and, the, and, and as you exercise your spiritual gift in the body of Christ, you're going to be benefiting your brothers and sisters in Christ and unsaved people. So that's the purpose, really. I mean, what good is it to go to school if you're not going to do anything with your education? Why are you going to say, Lord, I'm going to submit to you and, and learn from you and to follow in your steps like the 12 disciples followed you for years? Why would you do that? Why would you make that decision to do that unless you were willing you know, ultimately to actually put into practice, to implement what Christ has teach, taught you from his word? So then, really, discipleship should eventually, automatically, it involves service. And even you see in the Gospels how that Jesus put his disciples to work at various times. Not only did he teach them, but he gave them responsibility and said, do this and do that. And they did. But there came a time when Jesus was off the scene when they were very, very busy. Their whole life was spent, totally, in committed service to him. Now this morning, in closing out our subject of discipleship, I, I promised you that we need to look at one final, essential factor in learning of and following Jesus. And basically that is to simply keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Uh, he alone is the ultimate example of a disciple. And I want to stress that this morning because this is a fascinating part of Christology, uh, the doctrine of Jesus Christ. I, it's only recently, you know, in the last couple of years that, that I've begun to see this about the Lord Jesus. We all know, you know, we're familiar with Christmas, but it's almost like a detached thing. That's a fact we know about Jesus. And we know that Jesus died on the cross. And that's another fact we know about Jesus. And um, we know that Jesus went back to heaven. That's another fact we know about Jesus. And our knowledge of the Lord is sort of piecemeal and in many cases is unconnected. But really there is a thread that ties everything about the, the earthly work of Jesus Christ together. And that was simply that he was sent from heaven to do heaven's job. And when he completed the job, he went back to heaven. Everything that Jesus experienced here, from birth to death and resurrection and ascension, everything focused on the very thing that we're talking about in our own lives, and that is serving Christ. We are sent to serve. We are disciples. Somebody else is the boss telling us what to do with our lives, and we should submit to that so that we please Him. And Jesus Christ modeled that exact, precise behavior Himself, submitted to the Father's will and said, Yes, Lord. And he was sent. And if we can just refocus our attention on Christ throughout the week, 
if we would just make it a practice or a habit of thinking how Jesus would handle the situations that we bump into. Somebody talks to us at work and objects at something we say or, or the trials that we experience in our lives or whatever it is, whether you're talking about interrelationships or physical problems or whatever, work. Whenever we come up against something, we should constantly be reminding ourselves, what would Jesus do in that situation? How would He have handled that? And so that's what I want to do this morning. I just want to simply refocus our attention on Christ, always looking to Him for help, wisdom, guidance, and strength, so that ultimately we can serve Him the proper way. Now, I think some of you are probably saying, ho-hum. Well, I would simply like to say to that, that Jesus Christ is the center of Christianity. You take Christ out of Christianity and you have yanity. <laughs> Inanity. It's a shame when we as Christians aren't consistently very conscious of, of Christ. So two things I want to do with you this morning. Number one, I want to establish for you the emphasis that the Scriptures tell us just about this very fact about Christ, that he, he himself was a disciple. Jesus was a disciple. And secondly, I'd like to just give you, in closing this morning, four or five characteristics about Christ as a disciple. Like, what was true about him as a disciple that he modeled, that I should model my own behavior after? Tremendous example. No better example. Let me start back in the Old Testament this morning. Some of these passages we won't turn to, but we can quote them. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Unto us a son is given, unto us a child is born, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And Isaiah the prophet, 600 years before Christ was predicting that Jesus would be given, God would give, a son. Think about that. Not only would the child be born, it was predicting the birth of Christ, but it would be a gift from God. God would give His Son. So that's implying the very thing that John 3.16 plainly says in the New Testament, for God so loved the world that He gave His Son. What I'm simply saying about that familiar point is that Jesus Christ's appearance in the world was not like the appearance of any other individual. You and I were born. Period. We weren't given. We were born. Right? God didn't come out of heaven and uh, specially conceive you or me. Not that we were unplanned or unknown. We know that. God, you know, predestination and election and all of that God it tells us that God knew before we ever happened that we would happen. But Christ was special, foreordained to be the Lamb of God before the foundation of the world, and God sent Him. So He was given to the world. I'm reminded of the, work, of the words of um, Zechariah in uh, Luke chapter 1. I, I, I'm sorry this morning I asked you to turn to John chapter 17 and that's probably the last reference we'll look at. But in, in, in Luke chapter 1 verses 68 and 69 John the Baptist's father said this, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel for He has visited and redeemed His people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of His servant David. In verse 76 to 79, And thou child, speaking of John, you shall be called the prophet of the highest, for you, John, shall go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high has visited us. And Zechariah himself, filled with Old Testament scriptures as a priest, as a godly man, was well aware of the predictions that were there that God would someday visit his people visit his people. And Jesus Christ, John the Baptist's cousin, was actually the fulfillment of that. Look over at the, in the second chapter in verse um, 29, we have the words of Simeon, another godly man. When he saw the baby Jesus in his arms in the temple, he said, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. God prepared this light 
for his people. It's, the, it's part of the fabric of the scriptures. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 5 to 7, and, and you may think I'm jumping haphazardly through the scriptures this morning, but I'm going chronologically through the experience of Christ. The Old Testament be, predicted before his birth that he would be given from heaven. Right? In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 to 7, we have a commentary on on what happened to Jesus, what what Jesus himself experienced as that baby lame, um, apparently to all human eyes, so helplessly in, in the swaddling clothes in the manger. Look at, look at the commentary here. This is fascinating. It says, Wherefore, when he came into the world, he said, this is Jesus, Sacrifice and offering thou, God, desirest not, but a body you have prepared me. Now, Jesus was talking to his Father when he came into the world, and he said this, you, you have prepared me a body. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins, you, Father, have had no pleasure. Then said I, Jesus speaking, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. And the writer of Hebrews comments on this again, and he says basically what this is referring to is Jesus Christ coming into the world to do away with animal sacrifice by sacrificing his own perfectly sinless body as the final sacrifice for sin, to take away the old system and to replace it with a new system. Isn't that wonderful? When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, he spoke these words to his father. It's amazing. And it shows us, it gives us a little glimpse into the very purpose, the very existence of Christ's coming. I came to assume a human body so that I could become a sin bearer. That's basically it. In John chapter 1, verse 29. John the Baptist pointed his finger 30 years after he was born, and he pointed his finger to Jesus, and he said, Behold, look at him, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now that literally means the Lamb from God, or the Lamb that belongs to God, depending on whether it's ablative or genitive in the Greek. It makes very little difference. The Lamb that belongs to God, that it finds its source in Him. God's Lamb. That's who Jesus was, God's Lamb. I'm not telling you anything new this morning. I'm simply stressing what the scriptures stress. That Jesus' coming was no accident. That it was simply the, the uh, putting the implementation of a divine plan from eternity that God wanted a lamb. He wanted somebody to deal with sin. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 to 17, when Jesus was 30 years of age, he hadn't done any miracles yet. He hadn't preached to any people yet outside of when he was 12 years of age. And this was the, the red letter day at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. You're all familiar with it. Jesus went to the Jordan River. He saw John. He talked to John. And John didn't want to baptize him. And Jesus persuaded John to baptize him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway up out of the water. Lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending upon him like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Thirty years of age. God the Father spoke from heaven and pointed his finger and said, This is the one. This is my son. What an extraordinary event. He had been here for 30 years, experiencing human, uh, the human humiliation, lowering himself to become like his own creatures. And at 30 years of age, uh, John the Baptist says over in John chapter 1, verses 31 to 34, that this was when Christ was made manifest to Israel. This was like the red letter day. This is where he was sort of inaugurated to his public ministry. And on that day when he was baptized, this was the beginning of his service. Really. Just like those of you who are being baptized today, chronologically, it makes sense that you stand up and say, I'm publicly a follower of Jesus Christ. I intend to live for Him and serve Him for the rest of my life. Similar to Christ. He was being publicly inaugurated to be the King and Messiah of Israel. Everybody was being shown, and God broke the silence of heaven and said, Paul, 
This is my son. This is not just a nobody. This is somebody. You know, like that's the significance of it. See? So it's really showing us that this dominant point that we're stressing this morning that Christ was clearly sent. In John chapter 3, please turn there. John chapter 3, verses 11 to 15. On this familiar occasion, Jesus was speaking to a doctor of the Jewish law, a man that was a member of the Sanhedrin. His name was Nicodemus, a godly man, a seeker after God. And notice what Jesus said to Nicodemus, verses 11 to 15. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Nicodemus, we speak that which we do know and testify to that which we have seen. And you... That is, you people do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man who is in heaven, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And Jesus revealed two things to Nicodemus here. He said, I came down from heaven to do two things. Number one, to speak about things that are up in heaven. To speak. And secondly, I came down from heaven to do something that was absolutely necessary, and that was to, to go on a cross for sinners. Now that summarizes what Jesus Christ was sent to do. Jesus was a disciple. A disciple is a learner, follower, servant. And Jesus assumed a disciple role when he came into the world. As the, at, when he became a baby in Bethlehem, he was beginning to learn and obey his father's will to do what his father wanted him to do. And here, at 30 years of age, Jesus is speaking to, to Nicodemus, and he says, I came down from heaven to speak of heavenly things and to die on the cross for sinners. Now, I didn't count them up, but there are at least three dozen references in the Gospel of John alone. And we don't have time to go through it this morning. But it's fascinating. You look up the word sent in the Gospel of John. It occurs over 30 sometimes. Over and over, Jesus stressed for his followers, Hey, I, I'm not telling you my own business, my own doctrine. I, I am simply repeating what my Father told me to say to you. Over and over, we have to read a couple of these just to, to uh, stress it. Um, look at John 3.17. God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but He sent Him that the world through Him might be saved. There's the first reference to sent in the Gospel of John. God sent His Son to save the world. See? John 3.34. John the Baptist is speaking these words, and he said, For he whom God hath sent, that's a reference to Jesus, he whom God hath sent speaks the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure to him. Look at chapter 4, verse 34. Jesus said to his disciples, My food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. John chapter 5, verses 23 to 24. Jesus himself said these words, That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father who hath sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that hears my word and believes on him, that's the Father, who hath sent me, that person, that believer, has everlasting life. Over and over. Dozens of times in the Gospel of John. I, I told you originally to turn to John chapter 17. We have to turn there. John chapter 17, verse 18. There are several references in, in chapter 17 to Jesus being sent. Look at verse 3. Jesus was praying to His Father, This is life eternal, that you, they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom You have sent. I have glorified Thee on the earth. I have finished the work which You gave Me to do. Look at verse 8. 
I have given them the words which you gave me. They have received them and have known surely that I came out from thee and they have believed that you did send me. Verse 14, I have given them your word. The world has hated them because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. Verse 18, As you, Father, have sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Verse 21, That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. That's the whole purpose of living a Christian life. So that people will really believe that Jesus Christ is more than just a Jew but that actually he was the incarnate Son of God who assumed Jewish flesh. But he, you know, that's, that's the difference between you and me. I'm here this morning because my parents conceived me. Jesus came into the world not merely because he was conceived, but because God sent him. It was the Holy Spirit that caused him to be conceived. You understand that? Great difference. We're, we're stressing this morning the stress. I'm showing you the stress that the Scriptures place on the discipleship of the Lord Jesus. He was sent to do a job. He was sent. And his whole life was a modeled behavior of that essential thing. Everything in Christ goes back to the job that he was sent to do. He was a learner and follower. And I don't have time to do this, uh, to go through John. Look at... Um, one significant verse in Romans chapter 3, verse 25. I've often thought about this verse. It's a key verse in the book of Romans. Romans 3, 25. After establishing in the first three and a half chapters that all people are sinners and they're all damned and condemned in the sight of a holy God, Paul shifts gears and he says, Now it's possible for people to be righteous in God's sight. Look at verse 24. People can be justified freely by God's grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 25. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. It's very plain. Jesus Christ was no accident. God took His Son and put Him down here. He set Him forth. He, he, he placed Him here. Is I think what the Greek word means. To set, to place. God placed him here to be a sin sacrifice. Romans 5.8 God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It was God really that showed his love. Please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 3. This is a, a marvelous passage. The first two verses of the chapter. We all refer to the followers of the Lord Jesus under two common terms. We either refer to them as disciples of Christ or apostles. The twelve disciples and the twelve apostles, right? The very term is used of Jesus. The writer of Hebrews says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the holy calling, consider, think about, dwell upon in your minds, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. The writer of Hebrews' theme is Jesus Christ. Everything in the book of Hebrews centers around Jesus Christ. Jesus is better than the prophets. Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than, than uh, Aaron. Jesus is better than, than Melchizedek. He's better than the Aaronic priesthood. He's better than everything in the old system. Better than everybody. And so it's quite central to the author's purpose in Hebrews to tell his readers, look it, would you just set your minds on Jesus Christ? Think about him for a few minutes. Dwell upon him. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession. Think about him. There is no other apostle compared to Christ. The Mormon Church has 70 apostles today. The New Apostolic Church still believes that there are apostles today that have extraordinary power and authority. I'm sure there are other cults that believe in apostles. But the scriptures plainly teach there's only one with supreme authority. We too, in Jesus' own words, as Father, as you have sent me into the world, so have I sent them. Apostle is the Greek word. 
apostolos that comes from apostello, which means to send forth. To send forth. That's what an apostle is, someone who is sent forth. Was Jesus sent forth? It's pretty plain. We've been establishing that all morning here. It's the, it's the emphasis of the Scripture. Jesus was sent from heaven to the earth. Therefore, He is the apostle in the extraordinary sense. He had a commission like no one else. We're not sent forth like Christ in the same sense to die on a cross, to take away the sins of the world, because we don't need to do that. That's a once-for-all act. Only Christ, the sinless Lamb of God, could do that. But we are sent forth like Christ in a similar way to preach and to do. See? Um, this verse is significant because it tells us exactly what Christ was sent to do. He, is, he was sent forth as the apostle, quote-unquote, to become the high priest. These are two titles of Christ. The apostle refers to what he was sent right at the, from the very beginning to do, the high priest refers to the very final thing that he accomplishes. The ultimate extent of his work. He's high priest. What does a priest do? Goes between God and men. Is the intercessor. The one that deals with sin. That communicates on behalf of the sinner to God. That's why we don't have priests today. That's why Protestantism opposes sacerdotalism. You didn't get that, did you? Sacerdotalism is just a big word that, that refers to the priestly system that Anglicanism and Roman Catholicism and other groups have. A lot of tribal religions have, have priests. They have priesthood systems, you know, where you can't go to God yourself. You have to take an animal or uh, you have to do penance or something. You have to go through another human being to get to God. That's sacerdotalism. That's, it. That's essential to Roman Catholicism. Without that, you, have no, you don't have Roman Catholicism. You don't have a pope. The pope is the highest priest in that, in that denomination. You see? That's the essential error, the essence of the error of those groups. Because they have a man trying to do Christ's job. Jesus is the only apostle, the great high priest of our profession. We don't need anyone else. In fact, Peter tells us that we ourselves have been made a kingdom of priests. You're a priest. You're a priest. I'm a priest. That means that I can go to God's very presence myself. The book of Hebrews says that. That God has opened the way. In chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 6, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the very veil where the forerunner for us has entered even Jesus, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, let us boldly come before the throne of God in prayer. All right? We're talking about the disciple, the ultimate disciple this morning. I've told you that a disciple is a learner follower. Look at the terminology in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 5 to 10. So also Christ did not glorify himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As it says also in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears, unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared, though he, Jesus, were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Nobody makes themselves a disciple. I think this is kind of an important point. I'd like to dwell on it just for a moment. A lot of Christians are at loose ends. They just kind of wander around in their faith, not really anchored or tied to anything. But when you, cut, when you understand discipleship, then that anchors you. Because a disciple knows who his master is and he should be aware of his, his mandate. Right? A lot of Christians are rock walking around like uh, some people in government, you know, that they weren't elected, but they got a job to do. They're hired, they're working, you know, um, 
They're not quite sure when the government changes if they're going to keep on, keep on the job or whether they'll be replaced. A lot of Christians are just kind of drifting. They don't really know who their boss is. They don't really know. They've never been told to do something. They're not aware of it. But when you become a disciple of Jesus Christ and publicly submit to His Lordship, ah, that settles it. That simplifies it. I know who my Lord is. It's Jesus Christ. I know what my job is. It's to witness for Him and to serve Him. To sacrifice. To do what the Word tells me to do. All right? So I'm doing His job. And that lasts forever. Okay? So that you never run out of work. Okay? And it really it settles you. Instead of drifting around and wanting to be entertained and looking for this church. Oh, I like this church because it... I like it better than that church over there. You know, I don't really want to go there because they make it work. Uh, you know, a lot of Christians are just drifting. But a disciple is anchored to Christ and the work that Christ has set us to do. Now, I said this morning, the second thing I was going to do was show you how that Christ himself modeled uh, the very essential qualities of a disciple. We've already touched on many of them this morning, so I'll just say them in conclusion this morning. When Jesus was baptized, um, John the Baptist didn't really want to baptize Jesus. John was a humble man. He recognized that Jesus Christ was actually Jehovah, even though he was his half-cousin, sort of. And John the Baptist sort of balked when Jesus said, John said, well, you should be the one baptizing me. You know, I know my place. I think you and I would have said the same thing. And Jesus insisted on it. John Suffer it to be so now to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus insisted on taking a public stand. He knew that it was important that he allow himself to be baptized. Even though he was Jehovah himself, he had to take this public stand there in the waters of the Jordan to be publicly manifested to Israel. This was the beginning of his public ministry. Hey, that tells us something about a disciple. You have to insist on taking a stand. No sense being baptized, we're not going to live for the Lord. No sense. If you're not going to publicly be a Christian, why bother? You have to insist on it. It has to be important to you. You have to say, I'm going to. All right? That's one of the characteristics. Jesus insisted on it. It was important, and he wasn't going to back down from it. And remember what Jesus said in John chapter 17? Father, as you have sent me into the world, so have I sent them. The very qualities of Jesus as, a, as an apostle, as a disciple, learner, follower, servant, are the very things that we have to model, or that we have to follow in his model. In John chapter 2, we won't turn there, but you're familiar with the story how Jesus went down to the, to the temple in Jerusalem and he made a cord of whips, or a whip out of cords, and uh, he went through that place and just lambasted those guys, turning over the tables, and really cleaned house. And it says, for the zeal of your house has eaten me up. One of the characteristics of a follower was is, is zeal to maintain the purity of the Lord's temple. And of course, for us as Christians, we are the temple of the Lord. We have to follow Jesus. He was sent, you know, it, it, uh, you have to picture this now. Jesus came from the very presence of God into this world. And Judaism was supposed to be the apple of God's eye, the, the race of people in the world that had the knowledge of the truth, how to worship God in truth. And Jesus said that to the woman in Samaria. He says, the Jews have it. They have the way. And here these very leaders of Judaism were corrupting it. In the temple, they had turned the temple into a, a marketplace. Right? Instead of quiet meditation and prayer, it was, a, it was a market. Haggling and Jewing people down for a lower price. Exactly what was going on. And it's no wonder that when Jesus, who knew what the temple was supposed to represent, that bothered him. He got angry about that. And you as a Christian, it ought to bother you when sin is in your life. It ought to bother you when sin is in the body. It ought to bother you. You ought to be willing, you ought to have a zeal to insist on the purity of God's people, the purity of your own life. You ought to be zeal there. It ought not to be a secondary priority. It ought to be a priority, a major priority to, 
to insist on being clean and holy, to allow your temple to be used for God. And if you're going to be baptized, as many of you are this afternoon, you ought to be, follow Jesus' example. There ought to be a zeal there to maintain personal holiness because you are the temple of the Lord. In Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 22, At the very opening days of Jesus' public ministry, I think we should read this together. We're, uh, we've got time to read it. Luke chapter 4, verses 16 and following. Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place in chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. So Jesus closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. It says, The eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. They all bore him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth, and they began to say, Is this not Joseph's son? And so forth. I just want to take one thing out of this. This book was the stated foundation or, or uh, standard for Christ's own ministry. The, Luke chapter 4 is talking about what began in the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. He started out by letting all his family and friends know in the town where he grew up that this very book held the key to his own ministry, to what he was going to do now as a servant of God. I believe that shortly before that he had been baptized. Now he was laying it out in front of people. He went back home and he said, look it, this book tells me and tells you what I'm doing right here. And if you're going to be baptized and take a stand for Jesus Christ, essentially you've got to have to let people know this is what calls the shots in my life. Not your ideas. I'm sorry, Dad. Not your ideas either. Not my friends at work, not my buddies, not my fishing friends. This is what calls the shots in my life. Just like Jesus. You know, he used this as, and he said today, this book. You know, you're seeing this book fulfilled right in me, he says today. And he wasn't ignorant about it. He was very gracious. All the people wondered at the gracious words that came out of Jesus' mouth. He just said it like it was. And we as Christians have, if we're going to be Public followers of Christ have to be willing and capable and knowledgeable enough of the Word to use this and to let people know that this is the foundation for our lives. One other thing about Jesus Christ, and that is that as a disciple, He was faithful and diligent. John chapter 8, verse 29, He said to some people one day, He says, I do always those things that please my Father. I always do what pleases my Father. John chapter 15, verse 10 says the same thing. He says, the Father sent me, and I always do His commandments. I keep His commandments. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 refers to Jesus as the faithful witness. We've read Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession who was faithful in all his house, as was Moses. If there's one thing that should characterize a true disciple of Jesus Christ, not only zeal, for it to maintain, maintain purity, gracious dependence on Scripture, but it ought to be faithful diligence. I mean, always doing right. Always doing right. Now, I, I recognize that we can't all be perfect. right? But it ought to mark your testimony. Your life ought to be characterized by um, a real uh, commitment to finishing what the Lord wants you to do. Um... I, I talk too fast and I say too much sometimes, but I wanted to stress this morning that really, when you boil, boil it all down, uh, becoming a Jesus Christ, a follower 
and a disciple of Jesus Christ isn't all that complex. It's quite simple. The hard part of it is, is just doing it. <laughs> You know, overcoming our flesh. The flesh will lust against your spirit, and your spirit will lust against your flesh. And, but if we can get our eyes on Jesus, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, will be strengthened to, to live for Him on a daily basis. I, I have to go back to the Lord con, uh, continuously. That's why breaking the bread on a weekly basis is so important for a disciple. Because it brings me back to my faith, it's my foundation. It reminds me of just how much I need Jesus Christ. It's not a dead ritual. I'm, I'm brought face to face to my own inadequacy and His all-sufficiency over and over and over again. That's the only thing that helps me because I know how weak and how much I, how weak I am and how much I fail. And you need it too. You need the Lord. Focus your eyes on Him. Jesus Christ was the Lord's own disciple an apostle. And he models for us uh, everything we need to know to be the kind of disciples He wants us to be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bow before You. We love You for who You are and all that You've done for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank You for His faithfulness, His zeal, for holiness.